Just a minute. <laughs> Good morning, all you fine people out there. Um, it is Epiphany Sunday, also known as the 12th day of Christmas. And I'm so glad that you could be here. Our 12 drummers drumming could not make it today, <laughs> but I wanted to share a story about Epiphany, which is, um, has always been very dear to my heart. In 2012, Derek and I had the opportunity to travel to the Holy Land. That trip started in Egypt. And while we were there, um, we went to a school for Coptic Christians, and that all Coptic means is Egyptian Christians. And it was a, a school for children who lived in a garbage city. Well, we were very pleased to learn the place was decorated for Christmas in our terms, but they did not celebrate Christmas on Christmas Day. Their big day of celebration was on the 12th day of Christmas, or Epiphany. The Sunday closest to Epiphany is the one that we observe make a big deal out of it, but technically it is the 6th of January, is it not? It is. So I wanted to share that with you to know that Christmas lasts for 12 days. And I am so glad that we are able to observe it today. This is why we still have decorations up here in the sanctuary and all five candles are lit because Jesus arrived 12 days ago. And I just am so glad that you can be with us wherever you might be this morning. And we're glad that you joined us. Pastor John is not here. Um, Madeline's grandmother died of COVID um, last week. So John has gone down to Charlotte having been exposed uh, potentially with all family members who had been taking care of her. He is sequestered out of the way today. And so John, hi, we're glad you're with us <laughs> online. It's good to have everybody together today. It is also Communion Sunday, the first Sunday of the month, the first Sunday of the new year. And so I hope you have your communion elements in front of you on whatever in your home you have designated as the table of the Lord. It might be a TV tray. It might be a, um, what's that thing called? Coffee table. It might be the kitchen table or the counter. But I'm so glad that you're here to share in this feast with us as we remember why we exist at all as Christians. So glad you're here. And I know Catherine is going to follow that up. Yes. So good morning and happy new year to you. I want to clue you in to a little announcement that you will get a lot more information on in the coming couple of days. And kiddos, we're going to talk about it during our children's time together. But as Epiphany goes, and as our tradition has been here in the last few years, we have Epiphany words that we receive every um, first Sunday of January. And essentially an epiphany word or an epiphany star is our reminder that in this new year, we are to live intentionally into something that uh, creates in us a new God-like sense. Um, the beauty of an epiphany word is that you don't choose it. You pull it out of a hat, you don't get to pick and choose. You take it blindly and you see God's work in whatever that word is you know, that Catherine, you receive. Last year, my word was patience. Mine, I can't even remember. I think it was compassion, and that's tragic. But I, I, I chose a word this morning, and it is a word that will challenge me, and we'll talk about it yes. during children's time. Yes. But get ready for lots more information, because in the, in the still an era of difference, not like we're used to doing, we're going to have a special and different way for you to come and receive your epiphany words and make the promise to live intentionally into them in the coming years. So... Pay attention. I'll talk about it a little bit later, and you will be getting an email this week about it as well. So look forward to your epiphany word. Yes. Okay. And grab my book. And as we begin our worship here together this morning, I am borrowing words once again from Ted Loder's Gorillas of Grace, one of my favorite prayer poem books. And I invite you to pray along with me as we open our worship together. Let us pray. Oh God, grant me your sense of timing. In this season of short days and long nights, of gray and white and cold, teach me the lessons of beginnings, that such waitings and endings that may be a starting place, a planting of seeds which bring to birth what is ready to be born, something right and just and different, a new song, a deeper relationship, a fuller love in the fullness of your time. 
God, grant me your sense of timing. Amen. Amen. And my friends, in this time we have together, please join your voices with our choir in our opening hymn. Let's sing. Hello, all of my young friends. If you want to move a little closer to the screen so we can chat together or anybody who wants to move a little closer to the screen. As I mentioned just a second ago, today is Epiphany Sunday. And as a general rule, we like to start our new year off right with Epiphany stars, Epiphany words. And this is an interesting tradition that I had to look up and spend a little time figuring out exactly why we did it. Well, we know that we often celebrate on this Sunday the wise men that are traveling, following a star, right, to find baby Jesus. Although I think history shows us that baby Jesus might not have been a baby by the time the wise men showed up because things didn't move as fast as they do now. But the wise men were seeking out Jesus. And along the way, you're going to hear Pastor Rebecca preaching from one of the scriptures that talks about King Herod, who was a big and powerful king and was kind of frightened and um, worried about this Messiah that people kept talking about because that, you know, a new king means this big and powerful king doesn't get to keep his power anymore. And so he, he thinks he's going to pull one over on the wise men and says, come here, come here, let me know where this star leads you. Let me know where you find this Jesus so I can go and worship him too. Well, the wise men get to where Jesus is and sees Jesus and see, they see Mary and they realize they have an epiphany that this is in fact the Messiah and they do not go back and tell Herod what's going on because they're clued into the reality that Herod doesn't want to come and worship Jesus. They had a realization as to what their role in God's story was to be. And so on Epiphany Sunday, I think we work on having a realization in this new year as to what our job is in God's kingdom for the coming year. And to help us out a little bit, we have what we call Epiphany words. Well, I'll tell you, I drew my Epiphany word this morning and it is, listen. Hmm. God always hits me with hard words. <laughs> it's not a hard word to say, but sometimes it's a really hard word to do, especially when you're a chatty person like me. So I have to realize that God has a reason for me to spend this year purposefully trying to listen better because hopefully if I listen, I will be building God's kingdom a little bit better than I was in the past. So here's what I want you to do. This is everybody. This is not just kids. This is kids, grownups, everybody in between. Doesn't matter how old you are. Starting tomorrow, right out here in the front of our church, there will be a table with a box that says Epiphany Stars on the top. Your job is to come by anytime you would like, put your hand inside that box. Do not pick through it and find a word you like. 
Put your hand in the box and find the word that God intended for you, which means you just pull one out. Read the word on your card. They're laminated so you can keep them. They should be pretty durable. Take it home with you. Say a prayer every day about it. Stick it somewhere you can remember it and try to live into that word this coming year. But that's not all you're gonna do. There will also be a box of little blank stars like these on strings. And if you have come by the church at all over the Christmas holidays, you've seen that there's a really cool Christmas tree we have right out in the middle of the front portico here. That tree is gonna be scooched to the side, but what I want to do with that tree is remind us that Christmas doesn't end on Christmas day, right? We've talked about that. I want you to take a blank white star and I want you to hang it on that tree. So after you've gotten your word, you're gonna take a white star and you're gonna hang it on that tree. And when you hang this star on that tree, it is making a promise that you are going to spend time living into your word as best you can, knowing that you're gonna mess up sometimes, knowing that it's not gonna be easy every day. My goodness, is it very easy for me to listen when I run my mouth so much? No, but it's my job to try. <laughs> so. Any time you have within the next couple of weeks and kids be on the lookout because once we have all these stars on our tree from all the people coming by to get their epiphany words, I'm going to invite you to come meet me one afternoon and we're going to do something special with these stars after that. So be on the lookout for that as well. Okay, but come get your word. Come take a moment to remember that we are living into a new year of growing God's kingdom and there are specific things we can do to make this world a little bit better and then hang your star and make a promise to just try to do it well, knowing that God is with us in every single step of the way. Deal? I'm gonna try really hard to be a better listener. I'm gonna go hang my star on the tree as soon as we're done worshiping today. And I would ask you to do the same thing. And if you will, please pray with me. I will say it and then you say it. Here we go. Dear God. Dear God. Thank you for challenging us. Thank you for challenging us. In this new year. In this new year. Where things are not how they were. When things are not like they were. But they will become better. But they will become better. With your help. And your help. And your love. And your love. And our listening. Amen. Amen. Thank you, my friends. I can't wait to listen to your voices the next time we gather together. But until then, please make sure that you come get your word. You love yourself. Remember, God loves you. And we're all going to move into this new year with a little bit more intention. Deal? Okay. And as we move into this year with a little bit more intention, I would like to invite you to this time of offering to remember that not only are we receiving the gift of an intentional word for the coming year to work towards, we are offering our very selves to the glory of God in this coming year. We have a new opportunity to build the kingdom in ways that we had not yet discovered, in ways that we have never actually imagined, particularly in a year that didn't erase all of the bad stuff of last year, but is growing into the new ways in which we can love one another and serve God and neighbor together. So I ask you to give generously as you are able. And if prayer is your primary offering, please do that daily for one another, for our country, for our world, and for God to be in the midst of all of it. So at this time, let us offer our tithes and offerings.
let us pray. Gracious God, you fill the world with new possibilities in this new year. Accept our gifts of resource and of self and of heart and grow them into something beautiful in the coming year. Amen. Amen. The scripture reading on this Epiphany Sunday comes from two of the Gospels. First, Matthew, and then the Gospel of John. And let us hear God's word for today. Catherine has kind of already set the scene for you regarding the Matthew passage. The wise men show up in Jerusalem and everybody's really troubled. Um, And Herod puts on the charm and says, oh, please come back and let me know when you find the child so that I can go and worship him as well. So this is where we are as we start this part of the story of the the wise men. After Herod had consulted his uh, wise people, he secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem saying, go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word so that I may also go and pay him homage. And when they had heard the king, they set out and there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising until it stopped over the place where the child was. And when they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. And on entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and they worshiped him. Then opening their treasure chests, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. And then from the Gospel of John, the first chapter, beginning with verse 35. The next day, John, the Baptist, was standing with two of his disciples, and as he watched Jesus walk by, he exclaimed, Look, here is the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. And when Jesus turned and saw them following, he said to them, what are you looking for? And they said to him, Rabbi, which translates teacher, where are you staying? And he said to them, well, come and see. And so they came and they saw where he was staying and they remained with him that day. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon. One of the two who heard John the Baptist speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. His first, he, he first found his brother Simon and said to him, we have found the Messiah, which is translated the anointed one. And this ends the reading of our passages for today. Thanks be to God. I'm wondering, did you, did you get a chance to see it a few couple of weeks ago? Well, it, it, was, it was labeled as the Bethlehem star. Hmm. And it was the visual conjunction of two of the largest planets in our solar system, Jupiter and Saturn. And everybody was talking about it. And of course, Derek and I, who love to look at the stars at night and, and think about stuff, we, we went out um, at the appropriate time that WRAL said we should go right after twilight, about, you know, just gone down. And, and we had our little binoculars so that we could see it even better. We failed to keep the little binoculars steady. So really when we saw the stars, it was kind of like this, squiggly all over the place. Ugh. So then Derek went and got his fancy camera and we were able to focus a little more clearly. However, it did not resemble the star that we see printed on those lovely glitter-filled Christmas cards that we got. 
Now, some suggested that this was um, similar to the event that led the wise men to follow, said cosmic event, to find this new king who had been born. But who were these fancy wise men? They could have been on a diplomatic mission, and, and I believe that's probably likely. I suppose because they wanted to recognize a new king and, and create a positive future relationship with him, bearing expensive gifts, bowing before him, anticipating some sort of peaceful relationship between their countries. Or maybe they were so curious about this cosmic development that they just wanted to explore to see what it was and where it would lead. In order to do so on their own, maybe from the um, astrological uh, club that they were a part of, um, they must have been independently wealthy, if that were the case. To make such a trip it was not a quick trip. Well, the Bible does not tell us where they were from, nor does the Bible give us their names, which kingdom they represented. And, and we know that they were not Christians. I've had people who wanted to debate that with me. They were not Christians. These, they weren't Christians at that time. They, they were Gentiles. They were Arabs. And that upset some people too. We don't even know if there were only three of them or more wise men on this trek. This trek. We know they had three gifts. But the Bible does not tell us how many wise men there were. To be able to make this journey, they had to have had an entourage of others who provided protection, who gave provision. And we know they must have been impressive enough for Herod to allow them an audience to come and speak to him. Now we can analyze these international sages as to their motive for coming. They have, um, there have been many, many stories and legends that have been retold through the centuries, created to try to explain their actions. Our story says, um, that one story says, and I've got this little book, it's just really a cool little book, I meant to bring it, I'll show it to you next year, but that there were four wise men originally. This is what the story says, not what the Bible says. And one of them lagged behind because he ran across someone who was in dire need and he said, I'll catch up with you. And, and he never was able to catch up with the others and he wandered himself lost in his mind. And all he did was spend his wealth caring for those who were in need, continuing to look for the Messiah, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. And at the end of the story, he finally finds Jesus looking up from the foot of the cross. It's, it's really a powerful little story. It gives me chili bumps every time I read it. <laughs> so what we do know, though, is that it is an important story for the Christian calendar, which begins with the beginning of Advent, back at, uh, I think it was November 29th, was the first week of Advent. And we began preparing the way for the coming of Jesus, as we do traditionally. And for centuries, the, the church has used this liturgical calendar, they call it, as a way to mark time in our faith. It was even a, a teaching tool. It provided knowledge for the Bible. Epiphany was created. It was tacked on to the last day, the 12th day of Christmas. And, and the wise men are recognized as bringing the first gifts to Jesus. It's found only in Matthew's gospel. And from this text, we know that once the gifts were delivered, the wise men wisely did not go back to Herod to tell him where the child was, even though we have a general idea that Herod already knew, and, but we're going to tackle that confusion at another time. But this new year, with everything that has gone on this past year, I feel closer to the wise men and the part they played in the Christmas story 
because of that last little line in Matthew's account. It says, warned in a dream, they returned to their own country by another way. By another way. Stars being followed. I'm sorry. A star being followed. Expensive symbolic gifts being delivered. Lives being redirected. All brought together for what we call Epiphany Sunday. Now, it's a fancy word. And all of us have experienced epiphanies, those shifts in life that, that reveal to us something that we had not noticed before and should have. And those moments mean that something has clicked. You, you know, it's like when you learn to ride a bicycle and you, and you figure out that you now have transportation and you have a real sense of freedom to take off. When our daughter was five, we took the training wheels off of her bicycle and she took off. I let go of the back. She kept going. And when she realized that nobody was there to catch her, she turned her head back and she said, so long, mama, I'm out of here. And I said, oh my goodness. She realized she has been set free. And then she fell over. <laughs> oh, well, that's all right. She kept practicing. We also have an epiphany when we leave the security of home and family and trek out on our own and realize that we can make it in the world as adults. Well, one of my favorite epiphanies was realizing the depths of how much Derek loves me and he knows me and loves me anyway. That was, that was sweet. Oh, and then giving birth to our first child and I looked at him with his bright red hair and his purple screaming face and realized this child was mine, whether he looked pretty or not. And we learned to love a brand new human being. Hmm. And for the wise men, they, they carried their experience back to their own homes, a renewed focus on something God was doing that was really different. They had paid attention to heavenly direction through a dream, and there are a lot of dreams in the Gospels. And they had followed a star, and they'd found the King of Kings. And their whole journey, their whole life was redirected. And then we go over to the beginning of John's Gospel in the first chapter. There's no birth story at all. There aren't any wise men from the East, like there are in Matthews. There were no shepherds being confronted by a heavenly host bearing the good news of great joy for all people in Luke's gospel. But if we allow ourselves to look just a little bit deeper, we notice that they all have something in common. Actually, more than one thing, but what strikes me now is that each of the accounts that we have read have a sense of urgency about following, following Jesus, searching for Jesus and their lives and the world was changed forever. The epiphany of that moment made all the difference and ultimately in all lives to the present time. Now in the reading of John's gospel, we have been introduced to John the Baptist who came for a very specific purpose, which was to prepare the way for the Lord. And he even recognized who this was. He saw Jesus walking by when he was just doing his daily chores or whatever, and John the Baptist did not follow Jesus. He simply prepared the way for Jesus. And his message was to make the Lord's path straight. 
quoting from Isaiah. And he pointed to Jesus and said, look, that is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the whole world. And Jesus is the one who you really want to follow. If you really want to claim a new direction, if you want to know anything about the nature of who God is with us, follow Jesus. And two of John's followers, disciples, decided they would redirect. And Jesus felt that they were following him and turned around and confronted him. I kind of envision a, a kind of humorous event where he sensed they were there and he turned and caught them following him. <laughs> and he says, what are you looking for? What a great question. And they answered it with a question. Where are you staying? And then Jesus said, come and see. And their journey together began. Following after Jesus, being directed to Jesus, who always encourages us to take a different path in life, maybe an uncomfortable one, to follow a different kind of star, an alternative road that leads to Jesus, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of all the world, who takes my sin away, who takes your sin away. Jesus is always turning and confronting us and ask, what are you looking for? And this is where this new year of 2021 begins with exploring this question under the watchful eye of the Lord. Are we looking for the opportunity to begin meeting face to face and worship again? I, I know that I am. But today they've reported 350,000 Americans have died and there's a new strain. This is hard. And when our ministry and calling is to build community among ourselves and others that we serve, it's difficult not meeting together, enjoying the fellowship that we are known for in the community. But at the same time, I'd like to think this pandemic has made us more thoughtful toward one another, kinder, more aware of the joys of living. No one would dispute that 2020 was difficult and filled with sorrow and rancor and division. And much of that continues across every type of line we self-righteously want to draw in the sand. But 2020 pretty much made us approach ministry in a different way. Not the usual path that we're comfortable with year after year. We have been exploring and experiencing different ways of being the church and living out the calling that, that we have been given as Jesus followers. You know, it makes me proud. It's the good kind of pride to, to follow Jesus with you in the life and ministry of Wake Forest Presbyterian. Now, things have been different this past year and will continue on into this new year. But there is an epiphany here. I see it as an invitation to follow Jesus differently, responding passionately to reach as many as we can with the hope and peace and the love and joy that is ours in Christ. Jesus tells us that worrying about what might or might not be is a worthless exercise. Matthew 6, 34 says, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. And isn't that the truth? We are not waiting for everything to get back to the way it used to be. If we were, we'd be doing nothing. 
We are called to follow faithfully, paying attention to what is around us, anticipating, shifting how things are done as needed, being the light of Christ, being open to an epiphany event. And in many ways, we're there already. So what are you looking for? Well, we're looking for the same thing that the wise men sought. We're looking for the one who invited us into a relationship with God. The one who brings us to his table so that we won't forget. So in this new year, on this Epiphany Sunday, let's start it by coming to the table of the Lord from from wherever we are. And let us prepare our hearts as we sing the invitational hymn. Let us sing together. Friends, our Lord and Savior Jesus always gives us an opportunity to respond to his invitation. And what's her first name? Sarah. Sarah R. is a Presbyterian pastor who her ministry is developing and writing very meaningful liturgy. And we have some of her liturgy and have, have amended it as she gave us permission to do. And the invitation and the pastoral prayer, much of that has been taken from her work and from her um, wisdom as she prepared for this day for us. So let us hear this invitation to the table. The wise men were wise enough to take a different road. The disciples left their boats and followed Jesus, knowing that he truly had what they needed and wanted the most, the healing love the joyful response of of knowing that God holds us in his eternal love. And this table is huge. You might not think it's very big, but it, it extends around the world. And there is room for everything and everybody. And you are invited, as we always are, to come. We are not invited because of what we have Um, done or what we have or, or what we have not done. We are invited simply because we belong to God and that is enough. So we come to the table of the Lord, the best place to begin another year. We come with our questions, we come with our doubts and our fears, even with our anger. We come with our hope, with awe, and our love for the world. We come with all that we are, authentically and honestly, for God is undoubtedly at this table, and God wants us to all be together, even when we are apart. So as we gather, let us hear the words of institution as they were delivered by the Apostle Paul in his letter to the Corinthians. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord gathered in the upper room with his disciples, took bread. No, first he took the cup. Nope, he took the bread. I've only done this thousands of times. You'll have to bear with me. I have COVID brain, I think. But he took bread. And after he'd given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples as I, ministering in his name, give it to you, saying, take and eat. This is my body broken for you. 
do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, our Lord also took the cup after he had supped and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for many for the remission of sin. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you show the Lord's death until he comes. And as our Lord broke and gave thanks, let us also come before God with our prayers and supplications. Let us pray. O Lord, our God, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And when we look at your skies and at what you have made, the moon and the stars that you set firmly in place, what are human beings that you think about us? What are we that you even pay attention to us? We know you do. So today we come to you in prayer, trusting that if you can paint the stars in the sky, then surely you can hear us over the noise of this life. Today, as we enter this new year on the calendar, there's a great deal to pray for. So this morning we pray for those whom experienced 2020, mostly in the hospital room and in isolation. We pray for those hundreds of thousands who lost loved ones in 2020 to a pandemic that really struggled around the world. And we pray for those who lost a job, a home, or a sense of hope in 2020. We pray for parents forced to homeschool their children and for children who have missed their friends so much. And we pray for those who had to cancel milestones like graduations, embracing and hugging and kissing one another so as not to expose them to potential illness. And we pray for those who have had to postpone weddings and baptisms and confirmation and, and funerals. But Lord, at the same time, we pray in gratitude for all that you have left for us this past year, the signs and mile markers of hope on the horizon. We pray for scientists who continue to perfect a vaccine, even when surrounded by malicious conspiracy theories. We are grateful for such minds and the gift of technology and gardening and baking bread and learning new hobbies, using our creative gifts that we didn't even know we had. And we are so thankful for the wide variety of essential workers, grocery store clerks, teachers, doctors, nurses, technicians, the police, and those who fight fires, who serve and protect us. For those who deliver the mail, who collect our garbage, those who place food into the hands of the hungry. And we are grateful for peaceful protesters demanding justice and for people who look below the surface of what is happening in the midst of all the unrest, being open to being confronted by uncomfortable truths. This new year, Lord, pour out your spirit on this bread and this cup so that even ordinary objects were provided a glimpse of your constant love and hope, peace and joy. And we ask this in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior, who taught us to pray, saying, using these words, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And our Lord, as he took bread on the night that he was betrayed, we also take the cup and the bread. The body of Christ mixed with the blood of Christ. Amen.
friends, let us pray again. Heavenly Father, Mother, God, Messiah, Spirit, we are so grateful that we can come to your table and remember who we are and who you would like for us to be. We come to this table with the assurance that you are with us in the process, but we ask that you will provide us with epiphanies today and every day to come, with the realization that we are never alone, that you are right there in the midst of it, and that you are calling us to respond with your grace and with your love. So today, is, as we are at your table, we pray that you will bless each person who is with us this morning and guide them with an openness to look for you and to be with you and to follow after you. All this we lift up to you in Jesus' name. Amen. And let us join our voices in our closing hymn. church family and loved ones near and far and whoever's joining us today happy new year and may it be full of epiphanies that remind us that we're never alone and there is direction that we can take so as we go may the peace of Christ that transcends all of our human understanding keep our hearts and our minds in the knowledge and love of God through Christ Jesus and the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit descend upon us and wrap itself around us and fill us with his kind of peace. Amen. And Happy New Year. <laughs>